Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the fifth and final issue briefing of today's Summit on the Global Agenda here in the Media Briefing Center. Thank you for joining us here. Thank you for watching this live online. Thank you um, for joining us here on the panel. This session is about the global economy. We've segued across a range of global issues this afternoon. I think this is probably possibly the most important one of a lot. What are we all going to be doing in terms of the, the economy in the coming, coming months? Are we ready for the next crisis? What are the high points of the global economy? How relevant is the fourth industrial revolution that we're talking about today to the, our, our, the, our standards of living today and in the future? I'm going to stop my talking right now because we have a hard finish at 17.50 before the opening plenary. Um, so I'm going to introduce my first panelist, Luca Cazzelli, Chair of the National Bank of Greece. I want to ask you what have been the key learnings from this summer's crisis? You've been busy. Well, it, it has certainly been busy. Uh, I presume you're talking about the capital controls that were imposed in July. But uh, this uh, was uh, actually the culmination of a crisis which had started in 2010 when uh, Greece was unable to access uh, capital markets. Uh, what are the lessons to be learned uh, from there? Uh, from this experience, this dramatic experience of the last uh, five years. First, that uh, Greece uh, became vulnerable because it had followed a growth model that was based on financing consumption expenditures and construction uh, and financing it through transfers and foreign borrowing. So the first lesson is that any country should really watch out not to build unsustainable debt and uh, fiscal positions. The second the lesson was that uh, severe austerity, as that was uh, uh, practiced after May 2010, when uh, Greece uh, signed with its partners the first MOU, the first Memorandum of Understanding, can be counterproductive. And it can be counterproductive, as it happened to be in Greece, both on economic grounds, on political grounds, and on social grounds. So we have to be extremely careful as to how do we design programs, consolidation programs, which are needed, but they need to be fair. They need to provide adequate social protection networks, and they need, uh, first and foremost, to make sure that growth can continue and uh, we're not plunged into a deep recession that we cannot get out. So policymakers have a lot to learn from the Greek experience as well, and I would be happy to discuss more as we go along. Uh, of course, we're looking at it. We're, we're in a world where productivity is 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 is, easy, or is slowing down, and we're also looking at a world where competitiveness is is slowing down. The global national, the, the global competitiveness report, which the World Economic Forum uh, publishes every year, and most recently published about a month ago pointed to the, the a possible scenario where we're not ready for the next financial crisis. We don't have the resilience that we need, that we will need to withstand another you know, financial shock. Do you agree? Well, uh, uh, I would agree. Uh, I think we need to do much more at the global level not to have repeating financial crises. Don't forget that we've had a series of financial crises, especially uh, since capital markets have been liberalized, and capital is free to move from country to country. So the financial crisis uh, would be inevitable if we don't uh, uh, make sure that there are not huge macroeconomic imbalances, namely that some countries run on very high surpluses, other uh, large deficits, Secondly, that there are rebalancing mechanisms across country. Third, that we coordinate better macroeconomic policies and economic policies. And fourth, that we also uh, regulate effectively the financial markets. Uh, and I would say also correct some of the big uh, tax loopholes that exist, uh, primarily tax havens and so on, that uh, provide an opportunity for uh, some people to seek shelter from tax and create also um, kind of big fiscal imbalances in specific economies. So you really need global governance reforms, certainly on the uh, tax uh, front and also on the financial regulation. 
Beatrice Vader Di Mauro, you're a professor, University of Mainz in Germany, former advisor to uh, the German government and uh, Chancellor Merkel. What, are we, so what kind of state are we in? Rate cut in China in the past couple of days. Uh, we're talking about the ECB considering further QE in Europe. Are you afraid? Uh, no, I'm not afraid. I don't think it's a reason to be scared. Um, if anything, the ECB has once more actually demonstrated that it is uh, prepared to go an additional step if this is needed. And one of the uh, lessons of this crisis uh, worldwide, but certainly also for Europe, has been the emergence of the strong central bank. I think that we had underestimated how important these institutions would be in, uh, in saving the day uh, several times. Um, especially in the European case, you know, we, we uh, now can clearly also uh, put a date on the moment when the uh, huge uh, danger of you know, escalating instability basically turned around, and this is in the June of 2012, and it was an intervention, Mario Draghi, initially only an oral intervention, which then, however, was also back up, backed up by effective policy. And if you look at uh, the history also of this year, in spite of an enormous uh, renewed crisis with Greece, in spite of you know, a, a history where you're seeing um, almost every weekend the leaders meeting and not agreeing, and, and in spite of this, you look at the financial markets in Europe and it's remarkable how resilient they were. And now, you know, in this, this summer, again, we have new shocks, this time coming from outside. And again, in, in overall, it is more is a story of resilience rather than shocks, uh, especially if you compare this to the type of shocks that we faced uh, two, three, three, four years ago by now. So no, I don't think it's a reason to be scared, but it's a reason to be concerned. That's a, that's a different uh, uh, connotation. It's a reason to be concerned that, uh, you know, central banks, again, going back to central banks, are having to, again, do more, and that the Fed is uh, now to the global level, again, in the situation where it is doubting more and more whether it can actually start, even only start, normalizing its, uh, its monetary policy. And the repercussions this is having, on the other hand, on emerging markets and basically the whole dollar area, which is more or less the whole the rest of the world, are enormous. Yeah? I mean, it's remarkable that during the summer, a number of central bank uh, governors from emerging markets came out with a call for, please resolve this uncertainty, yes. Uh, you know, please do something, uh, uh, because resolve this uncertainty, this is having large repercussions on emerging markets. I think one of the implications of what Beatrice is saying is that leadership matters, and that you really need to, markets need to be led in a way, and uh, the the example of the Mario Draghi's uh, leadership at the European Central Bank uh, shows that. Well, it's played a very important role. You mentioned emerging markets, and Ale, you, you do a lot of your research uh, on emerging markets, and you're quite bullish. You have been in the past recently about China. What do you think about the, the, the not just China, but the, 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 the state of a global economy outside the advanced economies? The key issue for me is that um, while the discussion today, and we see it on this panel as well, is so much focused on the crisis, so much focused on the day-to-day -day fluctuations, what the Fed is going to do, what the global liquidity is going to dry up over the next month or next week. However, the absolutely fundamental issue is growth rather than the crisis. If you have growth, many other things are much easier. It's easy to reduce debt. It's easier to alleviate poverty. It's easier to have the markets, which may not necessarily have to be led. So the question is how to achieve growth. The absolutely key question and the absolutely key issue for the world economy over the short, medium, and the long term is the growth in China. To me, the focus on the alleged problems in China with the stock market, with the potential crash, the China bears, they're essentially non-existent. Well, let me explain why I think so. The large part of my recent research is on understanding the long-term determinants of growth in China. 
what are the key drivers of growth and whether they're going to continue. What we find is that essentially all of growth in China from 1978 can be explained by essentially two factors. First is the growth in productivity, and moreover, the growth in productivity of the private sector. Second are the market reforms. What I mean by, what I mean by market reforms is initially the price reform, in improving the functioning of the, the markets and the prices, the key role of which is to guide the markets, to lead the markets. And the second is demonopolization of the economy. What we find is that if the long-term trends of growth continue, the same trends which were from 1978, China is going to grow at 7 to 8 percent over the next 10 years and then gradually converge to the more normal growth. Well, one can say it's fine and dandy, but what about the worst case scenario? We try to calculate the worst case scenario, and our worst case scenario is what if China reverts to the same economic policies as those were pre-1978? What if we continue the trends of the Mao's era from 1953 to 1978? What we find is that even in this worst case scenario, China can grow at 5 to 6% for the next decade. So even this worst case scenario is actually not that bad. So to me, it's difficult not to be optimistic about China. It's difficult not to be bullish about China. And hence, not to be bullish about the emerging markets. But I want to have one qualification here. The emerging markets are still a large, a large part a misnomer. We talked about BRICS, the fashionable acronym putting together the countries which are very, very different. So rather than talking about the emerging markets, I think it's much more important to talk about individual countries, to talk about India, to talk about China, on which I'm relatively bullish, I mean, at least for India. And a different question is to think about the countries such as Brazil, such as Russia, such as South Africa, and other emerging markets. It's all about growth, not resilience. It's an interesting. Before we come back to that, anyone, else, anyone have any questions? Yeah. Um, uh, Frank Kane from the National Newspaper, Abu Dhabi. Um, I, I just want to know how we would know if there is going to be another crisis. Um, I, I was reading uh, Nouriel Roubini recently said that we need some kind of early warning system. I thought Nouriel Roubini was the early warning system, <laughs> you know, the last time round. But, you, you know, but what... What is the thing, you know, the, the mm -hmm. financial or, or economic thing, if, event, that would tell you we are heading towards another serious 2009 time crisis? Okay. One of the things that I would watch out for is a building current account deficit, which uh, is not mirrored into investment activity in productive sectors of the economy. Uh, so looking at the gaps and the imbalances and the kind of gaps you have is, I think, is a good indicator of whether you might have speculative attacks on specific markets or not. I, I would absolutely um, agree with that indicator. I mean, the countries that uh, get into trouble first and have gotten into trouble first in the past have been the ones that have current account deficits rather than surpluses. Another uh, indicator that is uh, very robust in uh, predicting crisis is the buildup of or the growth of private sector credit, which when it when it is uh, much much uh, faster than uh, uh, economic growth. So that is uh, actually one of the most robust indicators of a bubble. Uh, and you know, if you if you in particularly are seeing this in the real estate sector, then it is a reason to be concerned. Uh, those are some of the indicators that are being uh, have been tested in early warning systems and are regularly monitored. The good news is that this learning has actually been. Uh, has already now had, uh, there have been learnings for this in terms of policies, because all, all across the, uh, actually across the world, macroprudential tools uh, are being uh, implemented so that are exactly um, 
designed to avoid these kind of excesses. So there are institutions, be it at the central bank or special macroprudential supervisors that are monitoring these kind of imbalances and uh, very often also have instruments to curb credit growth, uh, hopefully early enough before they actually become too large. Let me actually disagree with the distinguished panelists. And I'll tell you why. Um, I actually think that economists cannot predict crisis, and it's very difficult, at least, to predict crisis. Let me cite two academic papers on this. One was uh, a very large study done by the International Monetary Fund, which assessed the early warning systems and the kind of indicators they used, including actually many of the indicators that my distinguished panelists uh, talk about. They do not work. They looked at the private sector models. Private sector models do not work better than essentially just throwing darts no, that's at not true. the board. I, Sorry, that's I not don't true. agree. <laughs> then we have to disagree. If you're saying it's a 50 50, then we. So it's we have another, another. <laughs> that's right. So another study by Andy Rose at Berkeley also argued that okay. if you look at all of the possible indicators that one could have had to build an early warning system to try to predict the 2007. 2008 financial crisis, they also don't work. Yeah, but maybe we can agree on something. Working, if, if your definition of working is it's always perfect and you always have a 100% probability, so you have perfect indicators, then we agree that we do not have those. But it is, we have better, we are doing better with these indicators than 50-50. So this is, this is uh, a bit of... Uh, <laughs> can I put it a little bit differently? It's please, like an earthquake. Briefly. You might have energy building up, and you can see the energy building up under the ground, and you can, can have indicators seeing it. When the earthquake will come, you don't know it. And I think it's a good analogy. But usually it doesn't take 1,000 years, which no, can be no, the case exactly. in earthquakes. And, and, yeah. and, we, and, and mindful of time, we must move on, but it was incredibly rude of me. I didn't, didn't introduce Ale, Ale Svinsky. Arthur M. Oaken, Professor of Economics at Yale University and a member of the, the GAC on Russia, a good friend of the forum. We do have a very hard finish, but I'm going to try to sneak in a very, very quick question I'd, I'd like you all to give us. And this is just a recipe for growth. Let's focus on growth, not resilience for this one. Ali, in the emerging markets, what one policy action would you like to see in the next 12 months to get to keep growth going in the areas where you think it's growing and, and rescue, rescue suppressed rates elsewhere? I would look at actually the reduction of debt around the world, and one has to understand that there is a connection between the emerging markets and the developed economies, and there is no such thing as decoupling. So what would happen in the developed markets would actually reverberate and affect very strongly the emerging markets. So that's what I would look out. Beatrice, in, in Europe, growth, um, please. I think the whole Initiatives around uh, increasing investment are very important, uh, but the problem is not only some financing has been promised, now we also need the projects to go with the financing and they have to be sensible projects uh, uh, too. Uh, but uh, I think that is an important um, issue and is, is something that uh, has to be addressed. So it's not access to finance, it's actually good projects to invest access in? Access to finance is no longer such a problem. And Very this is partly, you know, due to the actions of the ECB, this is no longer the prime uh, pro problem. And Luca, let's zero in on Greece. Well, for Greece, the challenge uh, is clear. We need to promote investment, which has dropped by about 12 percentage points, especially in the tradable sectors and exportables, restructure the productive base so that there can be jobs and value added within the country. Thank you very much. I'd, it's a shame I'd love to continue this conversation, but we do have a hard finish. The plenary is about to start. Thank you very much for joining us here and online, and thank you for joining us here on the panel. It's been thank a pleasure. You, thank you. Thank you.